Jackie was wrapping gifts for her six children in her brand new house in California City when her two youngest were taken. Trizel, her husband of 13 years, was gathering wood for, to light a fire for Jackie and their two youngest children when they were taken. There, is, there are no confessions and there is no forensic evidence. All we have is a story of a 10-year-old boy, their boy, their eldest child. This is Jackie West and this is Trizel West. And their two youngest children were taken. But their four oldest children ends is where our case begins. People versus the West. This timeline is going to be imperative. Throughout the trial, we have talked about December 21st, December 22nd, December 23rd, 24th, 5th, 6th, and 28th. And it is no different in the defense's case that that timeline is going to be the timeline to evaluate. What you have heard at this point in time, which would have arguably been discussed in our, in our timeline, is the investigation that was going on during that time. But there was a separate investigation that was also occurring at the same time that, that, the, um, that law enforcement was investigating, and that was Child Protective Services. When we look at December 21st, and we evaluate the, day, the um, incidences that are the most relevant for the defense's case. We are looking specifically at where does the priming occur with Adrian. Priming is going to be a term that is going to be used by our child forensic psychologist expert, Dr. Susan Napolitano, who I will talk about in just a second. When we talk about December 21st, We've already heard testimony that there was a proof of life or a welfare check that was, that was made at Wanda's residences when the boys were spending the night there. We have no information on how many officers were there, whether or not they were wearing uniforms, whether or not they were wearing patrol, they were wearing patrol uniforms in patrol vehicles, spotlights, yelling. We have no information as to the proof of life call. But that essentially starts the priming. When we talk about December 21st, we have another, an, another entrance from another agency where CPS has now filed this emergency out referral. But remember what the, the referral was only for Orson and Orin, general neglect, because there were four declarative statements that were made in that referral, that they went missing, that law enforcement was there, and that there was a video of them walking down the street. And because of the information that was provided to the referral, this prompted a 10-day general neglect call. Not immediate, not three, not five, 10 days. When we move on to the next day, December 22nd, 2020, this is a rough outline of the events that occurred as they related to the children. At approximately 7 or 8 a.m., Officer Hansen came and interviewed the children. You have seen those interviews now, of which most law enforcement have not seen. He was untrained. He had no formalized training, only on-the-job training to speak to children. Dr. Napolitano is going to talk about the fact that an individual should have some type of training when they speak with children in order to prevent any type of implantation that can then result in false allegations or false memory. Again, this is the beginning of the prime. Around 10 to 11 a.m., there is the FBI and Wanda have now taken the boys to the Jameson Center. We have this information as provided in Sonia Barton's first interview. She notes the time as she takes Adrian to go and interview him. Then we have a second interview of Adrian that was made almost two hours later, 12.55, also by Ms. Barton, that will be played now. 
at around 3 p.m., they were detained by CPS and taken from their parents. Some of you may recall the testimony that has already been provided by Clifton Taylor, the importance of a detainment and that a forensic interview happens after a detainment because if not, the case, the juvenile dependency case would be dismissed. Stakes were running high for CPS. On December 23rd, the next sort of priming is that we now know that Barton, Sonia Barton, and court social worker Pamela Castillo are involved in text communications. We address that with Ms. Barton because the importance of objectivity and a neutral mindset for a forensic interviewer is of the utmost importance as will also be discussed by Dr. Napolitano. We know, we know now that on December 23rd, the FBI went and did ground penetrating radar into the home of Aspen, of which there was no evidence, no human remains found. We also know that on December 23rd, the, for the van was forensically analyzed by Mr. Bianca and Ms. Brown of which there was no forensic evidence found. December 23rd is when the filing of this juvenile proceeding now takes it into the court system for the juvenile round, or when the detainment is officially filed. The boys are not going back to Wanda. They are not going back to the West residence. 25th, 26th, 27th we have nothing but remember when we talked about the first report with Sonia Barton and we talked about how important that sometimes reporting in a caregiver situation or with another parent oftentimes goes without a report so we do not know what if any information is going on within those four days but what we do know, according to Adrian, is that he has access to an iPad, he has access to the internet, and he has access to find information about this case. And then the 28th occurs. We will know that at 8 a.m. there is a juvenile dependency matter going on in which court social worker Pamela Castillo is present along with the West. We will know that approximately around 9 a.m., there is some communication about the detention having issues with the initial contact. And then at 11 a.m., there is the first communication from Sonia Barton to Officer Hansen. You will later learn that in these delivered service logs, these are like reports akin to police reports that are kept by CPS that Ms. Castillo tried to make contact with, Mr. Han with Officer Hansen and did not, and at a later point in time, had only contacted the FBI, which then she lied to Officer Hansen that she had had any communication with any law enforcement at all. And then approximately 3.36 is Adrian's third interview. We have heard no circumstances in which or how that first report, first report was made. Who was present? When were they present? How were they present? Where were they present? Whether or not he had received any information prior to hand, whether or not Miss Maribel Moreno was emotional. And all of this is going to be evaluated and examined by our expert, Dr. Susan Napolitano. She is a child forensic psychologist leading in her field for nearly 30 years. But unlike other experts, Dr. Napolo has, Napolitano has a unique perspective in that at one point in time, she too was in a forensic interviewer. And now she examines forensic interviews at the bequest of the prosecution, the defense, the FBI, post criminal or post exoneration convictions. Her, her, uh, her background is exemplary. She has had numerous 
numerous amount of time regarding training, peer review, and articles, written articles. When we talk about Dr. Napolitano, she is going to first talk about the history of forensic interviews. Why is it so important? Well, because the history of the forensic interview starts in the 1980s and the 1990s a part, uh, excuse me, with a slew of cases that were mass hysteria, child sex abuse cases, the McMartin cases. But not only did that case occur, but Kern County, we uniquely sit in the history of forensic interview, interviews with the Stoll case. It still remains the largest and longest and most expensive trial in the state of California. In those cases, these specific cases that have come as a result of forensic interviews, nearly all of them have, th have now since been exonerated. So she is going to talk about the importance of the history of forensic interviews and how it changed the landscape, the policies, the procedures, and what is needed for a good forensic interviewer. Because at the end of the day, the only goal for a forensic interviewer is to be in a fact-finding mission. Confirmation bias is another topic that she will talk about and how confirmation bias will seep into an investigation and ultimately bleed over to the forensic interviewer when it is there. Conf confirmation bias, if you are not, excuse me, if you're not looking for it, you won't see it. That's essentially what confirmation bias is. If you intend on only seeing one aspect of a case, you will miss everything else, like used diapers. So she is going to talk about the importance of confirmation bias and how when it, when it initiates or in, it is in the inception of an investigation, that it can then permeate into the rest, which ultimately can lead into a forensic interviewer. And as a result of that, she will state that this misinformation, misinformation, can then blend into the interview with the child. What does that, what does that then provide? Well, it provides false memories or false allegations. In reviewing the, in, in reviewing the, the totality of the interviews, that, that Dr. Napolitano is going to testify. She is going to look at certain data points. The outline that has already been addressed is an outline or a data point in which she is going to review. But she is going to take into consideration Hansen's videos, as in one and two. She is also taking into consideration Adrian's first interview with Sonia Barton on the 22nd, as well as Sonia Barton's second interview. What she is going to say, what she's going to testify to, is that Sonia Barton's second interview is an inherently suggestible, that she is browbeating the child until they can acquiesce into what she wants him to say. Again, priming, priming for that subsequent and last interview on the 28th. But by that point in time, it is too late. He has been primed, and the, the statement has already been made. And then after this, it becomes repeated questions after repeated questions after repeated questions from law enforcement, from the DA's office, from grand jury testimonies, to trial now, before all of you. He has been primed for the last three years. He has not seen his parents. They have not seen their parents or talk to them for the last year. He has been in the home or the custody of two people, Ms. Moreno and Ms. Isiaga. And as testified to earlier, law enforcement, Detective Hernandez and others have been going in and out and interviewing him. Testimony is going to be another key data point that we are going to, that she is going to evaluate. There will be someone here to read the grand jury testimony, and you will see that there is a comparison how Adrian reacts to both the grand jury testimony 
and to the trial after the break. That is going to be a key data point in which she is going to use for her evaluation. What she will ultimately conclude, taking everything, all of the data points that she has evaluated, these videos, these transcripts, and her 30 years of experience, she is going to conclude that there was implantation, coercive techniques, and that because of it, he was more susceptible to the likelihood of false allegations and false memories. Because ladies and gentlemen, what we have here, it's not peas. It's not peas. From there, we are gonna move on to our next expert, Christopher Armstrong. Christopher Armstrong comes before you also with 30 years experience, but his experience is unique in that he has an engineering background. He also, it, what he does for a living is a forensic accident reconstructionist. Now I understand that some of you are thinking, where does this come into play? Well, it's going to come into play with the videos that you folks have been watching at 10649 Aspen Avenue. The videos that were acquired by Detective Hernandez, on, excuse me, Detective Ryan on December 27th were then later enhanced by the FBI. Mr. Armstrong just took the videos and enhanced them a little bit more. He also was able to enhance, zoom, and take a still of December 19th, 2020. The video in which Detective Ryan says there's only two, two uh, adult individuals and four children going into the car. But when you look, and you will be able to see it on the large screen TV, but when you look at the still image that is going to be provided to you, it is apparent that there is an individual carrying something or someone, of which none of this was done by the FBI or by law enforcement. What he's also going to talk to you folks about is the video. The video of the car, the car in which no one saw prior to the opening with Mr. Hennessy. But that car that he is going to testify and talk to had a unique light source, AKA the headlights, in which he can evaluate with his, with his uh, expertise that the lights were going from low to high, high to low, and then low to high again. Insinuating that a vehicle stopped, reversed, and went forward again. Now, the other aspect of his testimony is going to be the videos themselves. Because at the end of the day, you cannot see the children walk through the video. But that isn't, and that has nothing to do, has something to do with the quality of the actual video, but it actually has everything to do with how we perceive, how we see things. And he's going to talk about contrast ratios and why they're important when you evaluate and look at these types of videos. He's also going to talk about lumin lum luminosity studies that law enforcement could have done to determine whether or not these videos were accurate to see if you could have seen a child walk across the field or not, which can only be done during the anniversary of the event. But we are several years from that event, so it could have been done, not once, but twice. He is going to talk about how the contrast ratios in videos, that the way that a person dresses, their stature, their ethnicity, will all take, will all be, uh, 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 excuse me, data points in which he will take into consideration when he's evalu evaluating those videos. At the conclusion of our case, it is still a tragedy. While the defense experts will give you folks insight, they're not going to answer all of the questions. The outstanding question of where the boys are will still be remaining. And as Mr. Hennessy said, it is still going to be a tragedy. 
but we believe that at the conclusion of our case, that if reasonable doubt is not already apparent enough, that you will have reasonable doubt and you will provide the only reasonable and just verdict of not guilty on all counts. Thank you. Let's begin.